Hello, my dear friends. This is the second edition of my new channel, X, in X Investors. Uh, once again, why X Investors? The purpose of this channel is to hear people from investing community, mainly people who are active or X on former Twitter. On my other channel, CEO and Market Expert Interviews, I host CEOs and Market Experts. But on this channel, I want to hear the other part of the story, the retail investor part of the story. That said, I would like to welcome a very dear guest and a friend, John Leggett. John has a big knowledge of Iranian sector and investing and shares smart stuff on X with no BS. John, welcome, buddy. I love to have you in my show. Thank you. It's it's great to be here. And, and uh, I feel like I already know you from your interviews. And, and it's it's almost like surprising that we haven't uh, connected in person before, but uh, now we are. So that's great. Yeah, the feeling is mutual, like we know each other from before, definitely. Uh, I love to have guests which I can talk uranium, uranium, and a little bit more uranium. <laughs> uh, yes. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you have more to talk than just uranium, but we will focus on uranium. Your ex-profile says you like to talk macroeconomics and classic cars. That's also very both, both very interesting topics. So... Are you in a business of classic cars? Uh, are you collecting them? That's my first question. Yeah, so I, I've just been interested in them since I was a kid, and I've had dozens over the years. And uh, I am now down to uh, just one. And then I have a, a daily driver that's kind of interesting, unusual. But uh, I, I divested a couple of them before we moved. Like I mentioned, we just moved uh, across the country. Yeah. And uh, so I sold a couple of them just to make it easier. And then I shipped uh, two cars out here. But yeah, I've, I've had as many as uh, four at one point. <laughs> so great. Uh, it's always uh, it's a lifelong passion, I guess you would say. Definitely. I like cars also, uh, but pr I prefer the new ones, <laughs> to be yeah. frank. Uh, you were a guest at Daniel's show a few weeks ago. Daniel's show, sorry, not Daniel's. Uh, his channel is Capital Cosm. Uh, it was a great interview. People should take a look at it. This interview was very well received. And frankly, I knew that you are very smart and that you are you are sharing very good content on Twitter. But after this interview, I realized, I realized we have one hell of a smart guy here, uh, <laughs> especially when it comes to uranium. Uh, for the ones who miss it... Uh, Give us a short overview of yourself. Uh, where are you coming from? Like you said, you just moved. Uh, what do you do for a living, etc.? Give us some some of your background, please. Yeah, so uh, I'm retired. Uh, retired about seven years ago, and uh, we just moved here from um, from Texas. My wife and I. <clears throat> She's an artist, and uh, this is a big artist community out here in in North Carolina, uh, in the mountains, uh, Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, so we're excited about that. In the meantime, we're knee deep in, in boxes and actually the whole downstairs is being painted. So there's <laughs> uh, workers down there and uh, hopefully we won't uh, hear music <laughs> coming up through, no the, problem. through the door. But um, yeah, so we're, we're excited to be here and it's, it's spring here. It's beautiful. And um, anyway, um, prior to retirement, I spent 34 years in the publishing industry and uh, had a lot of different roles over the years from uh, beginning at small, a very small firm. Uh, working the way up and then uh, eventually selling that to uh, a Fortune 100 company and then staying on there uh, on an executive team, a division level executive team. So uh, really enjoyed that, really learned a lot um, and uh, did a little M&A there. Um, it wasn't my my main role, but some due diligence, some M&A on some small companies. So uh, that's what uh, led me to make that comment that uh, we were going to discuss about um, your hypothetical company that's spending too much on <laughs> things, but okay. uh, we can get back to that. But anyways, that that's kind of my background. And, and um, yeah, I, I uh, do this uh, full time, I guess you could say, and just have try to have fun in life. And um, I don't I don't sell anything. Uh, so if you have to see anybody uh, saying that they're you know, selling something. I saw that somebody was impersonating you the other day and, and trying to sell stuff. And if you ever see that, that's not me. Uh, okay. like, if I don't do that now. I won't be doing it. Uh, you see the great microphone here. That's not because I'm going to get in the interview business. It's because that's my wife's. And You'll never it. know. Never say never. I can <laughs> well, say uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, six months ago, when not, not, maybe not six months ago, but one year ago, if somebody told me I will do an interview with CEOs and um, market experts from Uranium, I would say, on what the drugs, what drugs are you having? 
So never say never in my example. Uh, John, when did you start investing uh, in equities, in stocks? Um, well, uh, you know, in, in terms of like uh, 401k type investing and, and that type of thing, way back, um, you know, 80s. But in terms of uh, individual stocks and and uh, and trading, oh uh, five, oh uh, five, yeah. Okay. Uh, one question: uh, uh, the investment tax in your country. Uh, can you tell me more about uh, the ranges of investment tax in your country? Is it dependable okay. on which state is that, uh, or the whole U.S. has the same investment tax? It, well, the, the, the federal um, tax is, applies to all states, and, and that's pretty much what, uh, what affects investments. So the, um, it's easy for me to say coming from Texas, which uh, doesn't have a state income tax, but um, you know that's um, really uh, taxed on, on wages in, in uh, many other states. But anyway, um, so generally speaking, uh, it's a short-term capital gain um, if you are holding something less than a year, and then the long-term reduced long-term capital gain for longer than a year. Mm -hmm. If you're trading um, what's called a tax qualified portfolio, uh, like a, a an IRA or a 401k rolled over into an yeah. IRA, then you have uh, no tax consequences for buying and selling uh, on any time frame. It's just that if you go to take it out, uh, then you can uh, be taxed. Um, and, and there's a, under age 59 and a half, there's a 10% penalty uh, right off the top. And then the rest becomes taxable as ordinary income. After that age, it just is uh, taxed as ordinary income. So it just depends what tax bracket you're in. And what about dividends? Uh, dividends, uh, you know, same, um, same thing, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah, you probably don't know because you hold uh, non-dividend stocks, yeah, just like me. Sure. <laughs> yeah, majority. Sure. Uh, I, I mean, used to do a lot more uh, dividend investing, but it was it was in tax qualified accounts, so that's really um, and that, yeah. that's it's it's a great thing to uh, to be able to have that when you're learning to trade because you can do as many transactions as you want. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. But John, when did you discover uranium? What, which, year, which year was that? Yeah, so that was in the summer of uh, 21 um, when I learned that Spot was uh, was getting um, in the game and, and Sprott. And it, I I knew of them from, you know, their physical uh, gold and silver fund and some other uh, vehicles of theirs. And of course, Eric Sprott is kind of a legend in the resource community. So yeah, yeah. yeah. so I knew that it was, uh, that kind of got my attention and I'd certainly, I, I'd actually held uh, Cameco and, and uh, Energy Fuels um, uh, off and on before that uh, for trades, um, but I was definitely a generalist uh, up until then. Yeah, One of the but... things that, among the many, many things about uranium that I love, it's one of those things, I mean, first of all, you the digger, the deeper you dig into it, uh, the better it looks. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it, but one of the things that caught my eye right off the right from the beginning was this this lag time of um, once the incentive price would be reached for producers, it would still be some amount of time before um, production would rise to a level that to create equilibrium. And at the time, what I had read, what I was uh, thinking, and it still was very um, intriguing to me, was about an eighteen month lag for tier one producers to ramp up uh, things that are on care and maintenance and get a, get back to equal, equilibrium. And I thought, well, that's a good period, good long runway to make money yeah. um, if you really know the story. And then, and now we're, we're at, a, at a point where the, the tier ones can't keep up, uh, let alone all the marginal producers. And, and it's, it's become, instead of 18 months, it's become years. I mean, really multiple years before we begin to see equilibrium. And that was at a time too when there wasn't growing demand um, in a way that was obvious now. It was the, the the thesis was around just the burn rate of the existing reactor fleet. Yeah, and uh, so it's this is de risk just uh, exponentially from from the time that I got involved. Yeah, agreed one hundred percent. But John, what kind of uranium investor are you? Long term holding your position, or you are traded from? You are trade. You are trading from time to time, uh, and 
Well, I what is say, our approach here? Yeah, I, I would say adjusting from time to time. I, I'm not I'm not really uh, timing trades that much, and the reason why is because I'm so aware of the potential catalysts that I do not want to lose my seat at the table. Yeah, I think uh, in this uh, most recent pullback over the last what six eight weeks, um, some some people uh, have obviously given up their their seat at the table. And yes. at any minute, <laughs> you could have the Senate approve that the Russian uranium uh, import ban, or you could, and then on the heels of that, you could have Russia immediately retaliate with, because I'm sure they've thought about what they're going to do. And so you could have just exponential changes uh, at a moment's notice, because it is such a small uh, sector and such a thinly traded market. I just don't want to give up my seat at the table. I congratulate those who, who um, you know, uh, sold or got maybe got stopped out um you know weeks ago and have started rebuilding their positions uh but you know that's a risk i don't care to take and I, i've got um I yeah i was i was really i was deeply surprised uh, of the amount of capitulation during this pullback then not just uh, unknown names i saw couple of names that surprised me that had that approach oh my god the game is over a uh, spot drop seven, eight dollars, etc. But people, people do not understand that this uh, the spot drop was based on a very, very small volume, very small volume and one seller. So yeah. it, it doesn't change a thing. And when I when I wrote down on Twitter that this is a normal and healthy uh, correction, I was basically attacked from some people. This is not normal, etc. Guys, this is normal. Price of uranium doubled from last from in the last uh, nine or ten months. So there, there is no such commodity or stock that, that that only goes up, 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 up. So we have a, we had a correction, and now the spot price already is bouncing back. So this is nothing burger for me, but you, of course, uh, everybody should do their own due diligence and uh, make decisions they want. Um, what's your? Uh, did you did you buy some uh, stocks during this pullback? Uh, are you, my question is: Are you buying dips when you see uh, this kind of uh, corrections? Yeah, I, I do. Um, in this case, I, I didn't only because we were moving and uh, we had uh, you know packers everywhere and then, <laughs> then uh, drive across the country and then uh, you know I've been unpacking since. But I. Uh, I'm glad that you brought this up for a couple of reasons. So first of all, what I understand, and, and I think some people are still piecing it together, but I think it was 115,000 um, pounds that were traded and it was poorly traded by the seller in terms of um, the way that they did it. Instead of just doing it all at one time, exactly. they, tried to do it, they tried to maximize their return by cutting it into like three different tranches. And instead of uh, getting more each time, they were met uh, met with uh, lower bids uh, because they knew that that was, I guess there was more in the wings or something, but um, try, try buying a half million dollars, a half million pounds. Uh, yeah, ex exactly. No way. Or if you can manage that, the price would go $15 in one day or yeah. maybe even more. If you manage to buy 500, like you say, yeah. uh, John, what was your first ever Uranium company you bought? in 20 in, uh, when you started investing yeah so uh um uh, chemical chemical and um and energy fuels because i was already familiar with them so once i i sort of learned the thesis i quickly grabbed positions in those and then i started learning from there uh about all kinds of companies that i didn't even know about uh but i want to back up up to something for a second which is that sure. uh, on your um comments about to the market about uh, this being a normal uh, pullback and these things happen. Um, I want to point out for everyone that that uh, Lucian has uh, his pinned uh, tweet. You should go and look at that graph if you've never looked at it, because it shows the volatility of okay. the run up to the peak in the last cycle. And the really one of the really interesting things to me, I have um, it just was all over that from the first time that I saw it. And I've used it in examples with people many times. Yeah. But what yeah. I think is is interesting, it says a lot about you and the, the um, what you want to communicate. Mindset. To market, is that you, you could, uh, every time that you uh, have, a, you know, 
do an interview, um, you could make that your new pin tweet, the interview, and just keep changing those out. And, and it'd be the first thing people see when they, when they come to your profile. And instead, you keep that up. And so I, yeah. that's that's for a reason, I would have to think. Exactly. That's, that's for a reason. Uh, that, that is one of my best tweets because I I'm in uranium from 2006. I want to make this clear. I was in ups and downs and ups and downs. And really, uranium, uranium trade can hurt you. It, it, it's not for the weak stomach, people. It can go sharply up, it can go rapidly down. And the point of this tweet is to show you, to show to the people when we had that bull market in 2006, seven, really, we it was not a straight line up, like, like I said before. We had pullbacks, 20%, 30%, 40%. It's, it's a thing that you have to be prepared and you have to go through and if you're a long-term investor, that was the point of this tweet. And like you said, I, I hold it. I'm not pinning any of my interviews. I'm holding that tweet because it's it. Uh, a lot of new uranium investors said to me that th that tweet, the exact tweet helped them uh, not to sell their position during the pullbacks. That is one of the reasons why I hold it yeah. so long. I think, it, I think it's helped me. Uh, you see that, that stair step effect and, uh, and you know, I can live. I can live with the volatility. I'll, I'll say, you know, in in uh, 21, 22, <laughs> there were some moves that I want to say sh almost shook me out. But it would. They were, you know, yeah. they shook me up for sure. And and but now I don't sweat it at all. And part part of that is, uh, as I've mentioned before, becoming a, a student of the physical market and tracking that really as closely as possible, and knowing where we're at in that cycle. Uh, and the fact that we have uh, years of uh, restocking ahead of us of replacement rate uh, contracting. Yeah. Uh, this is reiterated um, in uh, Grant uh, Isaac's uh, interview uh, to the institutional market uh, that I just posted the link to this morning. And, um, you know, he, he um, really gets into the weeds in terms of the durability of this bull market. It, it, this is not a short-term thing. He, he estimates at least six to, a 16 year uh, runway ahead. And that's based on, on uh, current demand, not, not on uh, growing SMR demand and, and so forth. Yeah. SMR demand is not in any equation so far. Mm -hmm. And it, in my opinion, it should be at one point, but we didn't get there uh, yet. Uh, John, can you tell me which uranium nades do you have right now in your portfolio? Um, I have, uh, you know, every producer and every near-term producer. Um, I I'm really light on uh, Explorer Co's, except for F3. I have a really okay. big uh, position in F3. I've had more in the past, and um, boy, that they, they some of them really caught a good bid in 21. And then uh, gave it all back, and then some. Um, not to name names, uh, but um, yeah, I, I'm I, so I, I'm I'm careful with the Explorer Coast. To me, if you um, well, and of course, you know some of uh, what some people would would call developers uh, like ISO, you know, is potentially maybe even more of an Explorer Coast than a developer. So I do have positions there. So it's the more established ones, the ones with proven. Um, not just resources, resources but, but proven deposits. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, de defined, well-defined deposits. And to me, you know, a company like F3, even at this point, and I, I, I just um, ad admitting here that I'm talking in my book, but it's, it's, um, you know, it has the potential to be the next arrow. And if you, um, you could, you can bet on a bunch of explorer codes that never find anything. Um, and they might be great on promotion and and uh, and doing what they need to do to to hopefully uh, find some of these prospect generators and so forth. But I would rather wait until a company, an Explorer Co, actually finds something that um, is really remarkable, even if I miss that first or the first couple of moves. Yeah, when it yeah. starts shaping up to be like Ray Ashley calls this one a beast, that's that's uh, still you're still early enough in the in the um, 
the life cycle um, uh, of that uh, company that uh, you can do extremely well. Yeah, I agreed on that. And F3 looks like the all the signs of uh, big deposits are here. They are they are they don't have a big deposit officially yet, but right. all the signs are really pointing that that they have a world class discovery in yeah. the making. And uh, some estimates already, some analysts uh, say that it will be a 20, 30 million pound uh, uranium deposit. Some more conservatives say it's 17, 15 million deposit, but they are exploring it. And they, they explore it right now and they will expand probably that amount in, in much, much bigger amount. And what, I, what, what caught my eye is uh, the investment from Denison Mines. We all remember the Denison mine. Mines already had a move in 2013 when they had a transaction uh, with uh, with uh, fission uranium back then. So Dev and the management of Denison already have connections and uh, try to do some uh, M&A back then. But really, F3, there are big signs that there is something uh, over there and when you look at the grades and when you look at the the results from uh from their from their drilling campaigns etc it is spectacular you can yeah. say what you want about uh, management uh, i don't know where but when it comes to results grades uh it's spectacular it really right. is I, I really have to have uh let's cover some other names uh from your portfolio let's say do you we mentioned denison do you hold denison mines oh yes yeah uh, what's your take on denison mines oh it, i mean it's it's um you know it's a bit of a risk from the standpoint of uh the um you know ISR. the only isr player in 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 the athabasca but i think that they've de-risked that enough um through all the te successful tests, yes, that um, I just think it's uh, they get over the hump on that, and they're going to have the kind of profitability that everyone will be jealous of, and and uh, it might even usher in an entire generation of ISR producers in in uh, Canada. So, yeah, um, yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, not just that. Uh, like you said, they already maybe they didn't communicate that well to the public. They have extracted uranium. They, they did it. It's a small amount, but it shows that it can be extracted. And when I talk to the people, I see that they didn't hear that news in the right way. People ask me, are they going to be able to produce, to extract? And when I say, say to them, they already extracted. They had a field test, etc. And they say, oh my God, I didn't see that. So I believe that here is a miscommunication between the company and the uh, and the investors. And one other thing you said is uh, costs of uh, future uh, uh, Willow River uh, project. That is the only uranium project, in my knowledge, that has Kazakhstan numbers. I mean, in the cash cost uh, the or sustaining yeah. cost. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Those numbers are really, really unbelievable. Let's say if they go double in the meantime, they will be still unbelievable. And there is not a single company that can that, that, that can have that those kind of numbers, in my opinion, even if they go double. Uh, okay, let's move to UEC. Do you hold the Uranium Energy Corp? Sure. Yeah. What's, your, what's your take? Yeah, and, and, and uh, I even have... Uh... Uh, on top of the equities, I have a, a leverage position in that um, a a um, um, option, um, and I, with options, I tr I try to buy leaps if they're available uh, to give myself time for something to play out. Um, and I think that one expires in June, uh, as I recall. But but um, uh, the now I I I, I realize that um, it's made there there may there. Not overvalued, but they might be highly valued relative to the amount that, you know the amount that they're producing right now, and relative to other producers with the same amount of potential. Um, I, but I, it's not um, you can't look at it just through that lens because the the uh, the lens of liquidity and being um, being attractive to institutional players is is very important. I also yes. think that they're. Um, you know, they're, they're, uh, 
I think the largest position of URNJ, uh, let alone all the other in, included in all the other ETFs. So when the white the flywheel is is kicking into gear, they're they're the beneficiary of a lot of uh, a lot uh, more um, liquidity, and so I think they'll always do well from that standpoint. And then you've got um, you know Amir and 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 uh, uh, Scott uh, are so experienced and and so yeah. good, yeah, uh, and they're so good at communicating. Uh, so there's a lot, go a lot going for them. It's not, it's not uh, my biggest position, um, but it's, you know, I, I uh, respect the potential there. And of course, a lot of uh, people are taking a closer look at U.S. players uh, because uh, the the uh, Department of Energy is getting more funding, and and uh, again, yes. you know, likely going to be um, uh, placing some RFPs uh, that they're willing to pay a premium for U.S. origin. Um, cake and and uh so i think they're they're well positioned uh, to do well agreed on uac everything you said is spot on uh in line with my opinion as well uh do you hold enfield there? i don't yeah. uh i mean i i i appreciate that uh they have that mill it's one of the only licensed mills yeah i just uh think that uh the the way that it's behaved, I think it's it's not too late to grab a, a position at some point, but it's not um, it's not top of mind for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you said you hold energy fuels, right? Yes. What's your take on them, and uh, do you think that Mark Chalmers is doing a good job in running the company? Well, um, I don't. You know, I I don't think that they've executed as well as they. Um, as well as I thought that they would by this point, but I don't think it's too late either. I think we're, we're early cycle and people are just uh, just now uh, circling back to, um, you know, the importance of U.S. pounds. And I, I think even even them from a, um, an execution standpoint are probably um, going to spend more time on uranium than, than vanadium and, and the Rees uh, at this, you know, as we have reached in the incentive uh, price level. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, next gen. Next gen um, is to me the it's the one of a kind uh, resource. Uh, right off the bat, uh, in twenty one, Rick Rule caught my attention by saying it's it's you know how he does the rankings uh, for people yeah. with his sentiment portfolio ranking. Yeah, he he calls that uh, next gen. He he calls it the only um, the only must buy uh, in the <laughs> sector, and. Go ahead. No, no, no. Please, please, please continue. I yeah, have I, my dub, dubs with next gen, and I have my red flags over there. So, please continue. Yeah. I think it's going to, um, you know, it's going to take some time to build that that uh, that mine. It's not even fully permitted yet. I don't think. Um, and uh, so, and it's not very expensive um i think that you know they've they've got great funding they've got a, they've got a great position um i don't think it's really an unknown to other potential um you know to to let's say uh other resource companies that that might have an interest of get, getting into the space but probably some of them are still wondering if this this move is for real and enduring and um, and then yeah. at some point uh, they they may dive in for that. So, but I think that they're sort of hedging their bets in terms of being just uh, you know we're shaping up for a sale versus uh, we're going to build it ourselves. And so it you know it's painful at times, and <laughs> I know that's that's your hesitation, but it's uh, it is a must own. I think. Yeah. What? But what's your opinion on their GNA? They released uh, results. Uh, last week and they've spent 85 million on uh on fees on traveling or gna is that a normal amount for a non-producing company well of course not and and i like i uh, said uh, to you last week it, uh, it's ugly um and uh, it's not um it's it's not fair to shareholders yeah. And then, but but uh, on the other hand, um, from a M and A standpoint, um, it's not hurting the price potential of a sale. No, and the shareholders really don't object that, as I see it. And the price stock is definitely not su not suffering because of that. So yeah. I'm wrong. 
but uh, I'm one of those well, guys. Yeah. I don't think I, you're wrong. Um, I, I just think that um, I think a lot of people, probably myself too, uh, whether I um, articulate it or not, I, I think that um, I think M and A is the best course for them. Um, I mean, it's hard. This is already publicly out there, so I'm not, uh, and it's no, it's just speculation anyway. But uh, there, there have been rumors that not rumors, but just the concept floated that if if a, a, a multinational energy producer wanted to diversify and come along, they could they could uh, roll up next gen and, and fission and build them together uh, into one continuous mine, and it would save about six hundred million in um, in in creating that yeah. uh, and that's got to be real enticing to somebody like a like a bhp like a rio like maybe you know a shell or chevron or something yeah. like that yeah. the yeah. um and and if if one of those comes along then um when they do if they did an acquisition they would normalize all those expenses and say for example so if there's an executive that's being paid a quarter of a million dollars in the same position at rio um you know is one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year they're going to say to the person, you know, you, we, we value you, we hope to keep you, but this job now pays 150000 a year. And yeah. that, that kind of normalization, it would be done for every single expense and every expense that's, you know, uh, an excess owner benefit would just be eliminated. And the cost of eliminating it, including if there's any kind of loss with that, um, is, uh, you know, an acquisition expense, a one-time thing, which isn't, isn't, uh, counted against the transaction either. So they're not negatively affecting the, the potential sale uh, value of the company. But in the meantime, it, it's, it, a lot of it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, sponsoring the Canucks and, mm -hmm. and Formula One and so forth. But, and I, I, uh, I don't know enough to really be, uh, uh, you know, I'm not accusing them of anything. What we don't, what a lot, what people don't know, and you could, you can just uh, play this out any way you want. But I mean, there could be, that somebody that owns one of the Formula One teams is a potential acquirer, or you, know, <laughs> you can you can kind of play those things through. And I don't see that scenario, through. but it's not impossible. Yeah, 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 definitely, it's not impossible. Okay, let's move. Uh, do you own uh, fission uranium? I do. I don't. Uh, it's not a. It's not a big position. I, I don't spend a lot of time uh, really thinking about it, and I probably should because I, I I know it it. Uh, you know the numbers are there, and it's and it's undervalued. I know it's 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 Professor Quake's largest position. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, what about some African names? Do you hold any African names? Namibia, Niger, uh, let's say DPL Bannerman, or in Niger Gobiex Global Atomics, uh, Global Atomic. Do you own any of these names? Yeah. So all all of them. Uh, <laughs> all of them. Uh, all of those. Yeah. Um, but with it, with an emphasis on on global, um, I think that I mean obviously the near term producer. It's a great. I think uh, you know other than the geopolitical risk there, um, everything else about it, may, it you know adds up well, uh, makes perfect sense, and it's it's the only uh, greenfield uh, you know producer that's uh, yes. you know, building out the mine uh, as we speak, and that's that's going to have a lot of. Uh, you know, get a lot of attention once they start producing. The um, uh, so the, the, there's that one, and then I, I've mentioned before that I have an outside outside uh, interest in Lotus, um, and um, you know, it's the I tend not to even look at the um, at their recent acquisition as as being a big uh, part of that. It's mostly uh, in my mind the importance of getting uh, Kyla Kira uh, back to uh, producing and. And uh, and they're right on the cusp of that now. They're they're um, they're you know uh, flush with cash and ready to to make those steps. And the and the uh, Malawi mining um, uh, approval process was just granted um, the other day. I think um, I, yeah. I thought they already, they already had it, but um, but it's good to know that they're they have the current uh, stamp of approval. Yeah, what about Gobiex uranium? Let's return on the Niger companies. Yeah, I think it's I think it's uh, highly undervalued, uh, but I it's not a large position for me. Yeah, but when you look at the uh, pounds in the ground metric, they are the most undervalued company out there. 
because they have a big amount of uranium in the ground, but they have some other things that uh, are pushing the stock down all the time. Yeah. Uh, what about Bannerman and Deep Yellow? Yeah, so uh, I've had them for a long time, and and uh, and I um, I probably have a, a higher cost basis than uh, anybody would like to have, but I I did uh, add to them uh, over you know over the last couple of years at some of the lowest points, and and uh, you know brought some moderation to that, but um, I don't spend a lot of time you know, holding my breath that either, you know, anything big is going to happen with either of them right away. And it could, that, you know, they could any time. And that's part of keep why you keep a seat at that table. But I think that, um, uh, sorry, I got a little distraction. I was like, no problem. But, no, no problem. Um, yeah, the, the, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, li I like the potential for both and they're, they're going to be needed. And, um, but you know, how, how soon do we get to production? It, it's hard to say. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and let's touch a little bit on the explorers. Can you name what explorers do you like own in the Uranium space? Yeah, so like I said, I just, uh, F3 um, is, a, is an outsized position. I think that's the, gonna be the winner of this cycle, given the, just the amount of time it takes to really, you know, to, to discover something and then to, you know, uh, sure up um, it as a deposit with all the third party, um, um, you know, checks and balances that need to occur before you know it's it's the real deal. I and grades matter and so forth. I know that um, it's certainly far more expensive to drill in the Athabasca than it is to uh, in the U.S., for example. And Definitely. so we Definitely. do keep a little position in, in uh, Strathmore. Uh, as a result, but um, but yeah, I, I'm not I'm not big in the explorer space. So it, it's interesting. I think about uh, like um, Terry uh, Papineau, who's 100% explorers, and yeah. uh, and yeah. I have I just have, I have a different. I'm more uh, thinking about how soon companies can get to sustainable cash flow um, type of situation. Not that they're. I mean, they some never. Some returns, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some never, but I I believe, in my opinion, there are a few very perspective and very interesting uh, explorers out there. Of course, majority of them will never produce a pound of uranium, but there are some perspective names out there, definitely. Uh, okay, let's move on. Uh, uranium uh, company CEOs, who are your favorites and why? Gosh, um, if you can name uh, three, maybe. Yeah. Um, well, maybe you love Dev, probably Devra <laughs> Dava. Sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, you know, it, it's interesting because some of them are 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 really articulate and they're really great spokes than for the industry. Um, and um, I'm thinking of uh, the gentleman at Bannerman and I can't believe that I'm, I'm kind of blanking on it, but um, uh, anyway, um, it doesn't mean that they're- You mean Brandon Monroe? Yeah, Brandon. Um, so, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, e e Tango is a great property on paper <laughs> and Brandon is terrific uh, spokes person for the industry and beloved and, you know, and appreciated by everyone, including me, but it doesn't mean that they're going to be producing right away. Right. So, um, you know, it's just different, um, uh, you know, different things I like about different ones. I mean, David Cates, uh, is a, he's a detail guy, uh, like yeah. I am. And I think that part of maybe why, uh, you, you didn't get clarity around certain uh, things is because he, uh, all those details are important to him, right? So he's he's delving into all of them at the same time, and and uh, um, but he's I think he's terrific. But I like people like that that are um, that are hands on and and uh, know every aspect of their business. Um, Keith Keith Bose at, at Lotus is another one. Um, so anyway, 
Okay. I wasn't prepared for that question. No, actually. no, no problem. Don't uh, it's not a problem. But I definitely agree on David Cates. He's one of the sharpest guys out there. I spoke with David a couple of times. And the amount of knowledge, the amount of information that this gentleman has in his head, it's unbelievable. I would oh, say and, and uh, Steve, and I have to throw in Stephen Roman too. I mean, yeah, uh, same he was same with Stephen. Yeah. Raised in a uranium mine and with his uh, with his family background, and and yeah. there's really few people that know more about what needs to occur than he does in the it, in the current generation. And that's part of the problem is you've got a lot of lost knowledge uh, from the last cycle to this one, um, and you know from even before that. And yeah. it's it's tricky. There's a lot of people that have mining backgrounds, but they've never produced uranium. So it's it's interesting. Exactly. And with Steven, he he's he was in uranium mines. He told me what in one interview that he went to uranium mine when he was like nine or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So definitely I told him I had an interview last week, a few days ago, not last week, uh, like three days ago with Steven. And I said to him, You really have uranium in your blood. And he said, Yeah, I do. <laughs> and and the amount of energy that that this man has that that's unbelievable. He's not a young boy anymore. And he has a certain age, but he's uh, he has the energy to build three three Dasa mines, not one. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, John, people on site right now, which is you know that's a big job. Yeah, definitely. It's going to double. I think it, you know from three hundred to seven hundred or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Just to travel for, uh, every time from Canada to. To, to Africa, etc. You have to have string for, for, for that. Uh, John, I want to ask you a little bit about the due diligence, uh, your research before invest before investing. How does that process looks uh, look like for you? Uh, I mean, do you rely on available data like corporate presentation documents or you pick up a phone sometimes or reach out to them by emails with your questions? What's your strategy? Well, I try to, of course, never miss uh, the types of interviews that you're doing uh, and your colleagues uh, in the interview space are doing, and um, that's very helpful. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, analysts like Red Cloud and and um, you know um, uh, several of those uh, can accord. Um, the, those reports are very helpful too in terms yeah. of. Uh, because they're they're looking at more than one company at the same time, and they uh, can help you contrast and compare along with just providing uh, the the data. Yeah, definitely. But are you attending like conferences? Are you reading financial statements and uh, MDNA? Um, you know, occasionally, especially if I have a question, um, and of course. Um, uh, quarterly conference calls uh, I'm on and um, and um, always stay for the Q&A and, and, uh, and that type of thing um, and read the associated literature. Uh, I haven't been attending conferences. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, start uh, doing that. Uh, and I think being here uh, on the East Coast uh, now, that will helps. Be easier. Yeah. yeah, there's no, regular no. Um, Meetings, I think of NEI in, in uh, Charlotte and, um, and yes. in DC and so forth. So, uh, and WMA. Well, uh, definitely, a few conferences on the East Coast. There are a few great ones, uh, and in Canada also. The last one was last week uh, in Toronto. It was PDAC, and then, then we have uh, uh, Vancouver uh, Resource Investing in uh, January. So, a lot of conferences on your part of the world. In mine, not so. I mean, I'm in Croatia, I'm in Europe, so we don't have it. We have very few investment conferences. Now, will you go up to a WNA in London um, uh, this year? Yes, yes. I was in, uh, by the way, I was on Mines and Money in London uh, in uh, in October. Uh, this year, I will go two times in London. First is WNA Symposium in, in September. And uh, then again on uh, Minds and Money in uh, early December, I believe this year. But definitely, I will go to WNA Symposium. I booked a hotel last week, so <laughs> I, I'm going. Yeah. I'm actually thinking of going to that one this time. So great, great timing for beers and dinner. Yeah, amen. We should go out on the pub in some pub and discuss uranium. Definitely, we will arrange that. 
Uh, John, what about dilution, uh, especially with junior exploration companies? We know that is the only way that they can get capital for the company. But we saw we saw a lot of examples where money is going everywhere, but where it's supposed to be, and that is in the ground. That is that is for the lifestyle companies. Uh, do you see a lot of companies operate like this? Have you? done some due diligence on the lifestyle companies. Yeah, so of course, um, a lot of those are explorer coasts, right? Um, and um, so I, I'm looking more at developers and producers. And so it, it's a little bit easier to follow where the, what the money is being used for. Yeah. Um, and um, and I, I, I think uh, the extent to which they're trying to avoid dilution um, because is help is helpful too. I mean, if they have a track record of, of I mean, some amount of it is inevitable. Um, but if you if if you see that they're actively trying to find ways to avoid that, then then that's you know, mm -hmm. I, I give them points for that. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that uh, spot will stay in the same format, or we could see some changes going forward? Stay in the same what? Uh, I mean, uh, spot, uh, spot physical uranium trust. Will it stay in the same format, or we could see some changes going forward with that model of they have format? Um, yes, yeah, so I, I think that I think it actually is is a good structure. I mean, I I know that it was believed that had they been able to um, come up with the um, or get approval for the uh, ability to. Uh, for uh, qualified um, utilities to buy in and and uh, and then be able to um, uh, redeem uh, some pounds uh, that that would have brought it closer to now, but that's that's speculation. And um, you know, you may see something like that come back around if there's this persistent uh, discount to now. Yeah. But you know, um, I actually, you know, it, when uh, spot. When the spot price took a nosedive, uh, what a week or so ago, I I thought, well, there's there's more than one way to uh, to get back to now, yeah. and that would be one of them. It's not what most people would want to see, but it it, it kind of worked from the standpoint if if that was if anyone was trying to to get there because they they actually went they were actually um, off you know uh, selling units for for a moment there yesterday, so. Anyway, I, I think I don't think there's anything wrong with the, the format. I think it's a great structure. I wish more people understood that um, that that's not uh, a, a resource in aggregate that's going to get ever dumped on the market uh, as a whole um, without sh extensive, you know, shareholder approval because the shareholders, the unit holders, own those pounds yeah, and yeah. Uh, always uh, pound the table on that one. And I think I think I'd be I'd love to see a survey of fuel buyers to see how many of them understand that um, or think that, you know, oh, there can't be that big a shortage if, if uh, Sprott is not even uh, burning any uh, pounds, um, you know, use, uh, consuming any fuel has this great resource, but it doesn't mean that's theirs. They're just, yeah. they just manage it. So. Yeah, agreed. Uh, let's cover some hot topics on uranium market, starting with the most recent one, and that is Gazetta from 2023 financial results. Have you had the chance to see the numbers? What's your take here? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, uh, my biggest takeaway, uh, I mean, I was hoping for uh, them to disclose uh, the uh, size and duration of the two Chinese entity contracts that they signed in 23, and they once again successfully avoided that. Yes. Um, but in terms of uh, production, uh, you know, outlook, uh, I, was, I wasn't that surprised. Uh, I do think that uh, it it's telling that they have already moved back. It, it was too ambitious of a goal, and they but they sort of have a track record now of setting too ambitious of, goal, of goals and then not meeting them. But one one of them was on the the building of that um, the second sulfuric acid plant. Um, to think that they could do what took six years last time to do it in mm. two was unrealistic, and now they're seeing three. But really. It's uh, more of a five, I yeah, believe. Yeah, and then uh, you know somewhere in that there, and and uh, and then you know you've got another uh, nine to eighteen months before you can you know 
nine months to start getting ore after you're doing the injections to 18 months before you're fully ramped up to uh, to um, maximum wellhead production. So that you're talking, uh, this is this just uh, goes back to the point of it being years of a runway here to to uh, do really well um, as demand, you know, existing demand uh, is robust and and then uh, it's growing on top of that. So. Yeah. What about chemical? Do you believe that they will have to go to the spot market to fill their gap? Uh, I don't. I don't know. Um, uh, whether or not they will. I mean, uh, Grant, I just, I mean, that's kind of top of mind because I just listened to that last night with his inst institutional um, call. And uh, he's, he's got saying, to be yeah, yeah, he's got to with them. And I, I don't, I, I mean, he's always straight with people, right? But I mean, you can, you know, he's a great communicator and he's a great, you know, he can, um, I think, get excited about stuff the same way that any of us can. But I th you've got an obligation when you're talking to institutional investors to absolutely uh, get it right. And he's he really downplayed that um, in this in this call and um and really sort of reset the um the the outlook in terms of uh how uh quickly Brownfield could come on, how reliably it could come on, and that they're they're just not gonna do it until they're there's a uh, home for those pounds. Um, they don't care if a greenfield gets out in front of them um, because uh, uh, they they can absolutely rely on these uh, the, the second uh, tier of resources. I, you know, prior to, to that sort of uh, hearing that level of conviction, I was thinking that you know they're probably a little nervous about the the uh, the U.S. brownfields in terms of uh, you know, supply chain issues, especially uh, human resources, uh, finding the right staff. I, I know, I'm pretty sure it was uh, the professor that that um, floated the idea of them uh, that they should acquire Penn, uh, not uh, so much for uh, for their resources as much as for their uh, their management and staff, kind of like an aqua hire. And I thought that that made a lot of sense. And and the implication was that that would be needed in order to uh, really jumpstart those brownfield uh, resources in the U.S. But it's, it, to hear him last night, it was kind of like, um, you know, those are a sure thing as soon as they, you know, turn the switch. I mean, it's not like they could, would produce instantly, but they would be able to execute once they decided they could execute. So uh, yeah, it's certainly a well-run company. I, I I I don't like the um, you know the, the people that come out of left field. I and I also have, have extensive knowledge, but the ones that are always uh, batting them, uh, you know, taking swipes at their um, having uh, done long term uh, contracts uh, at much lower prices. But you know they have big big public company to run, yeah. a lot of employees. These mines, it, you know, some of them, if you put them on care and maintenance with the freeze walls and so forth, you can have all kinds of problems um, uh, beyond uh, what they what they already had uh, getting back up to production. And so I, I don't I don't really fault them for that. I think it's I think they're executing really well. I think they they are right to have uh, some new focus around the whole nuclear fuel cycle as a result of uh, Westinghouse and and I, he I mean, he was also very. Um, uh, conservative about their outlook on GLE, um, but uh, and realistic, I would say is probably the better word. So yeah. I think it's a, I think it's a great company, very well, well run. Agreed. Uh, what are the best? Who are the best follows on Twitter for you? Your top ten people that you have that you believe they have wide knowledge and quality content, uranium related, of course. Yeah, I sh I should have. Uh, uh written some down but I, i'm just gonna let me let me do this is, is to say sure look, look for people who are in the industry who actually work in the uranium industry um certainly uh see you know to the ceos um that you interview for example they're they're to some extent they're always talking to their book i mean of whether course. they want to or not it's it's just you know subconsciously there yes um so your people that are that are um uh, that are sort of more in a neutral position, like Dustin Garrow, who's a, a consultant in the space, uh, Bram Velderus, Bram uh, Vanderus, Van yeah, yeah, um, and Pierre Jander. Uh, those three, 
uh, certainly. Um, and then your full-time uh, uranium analysts like uh, like Mike Galkin, um, like uh, Guy Keller, um, Art Hyde, and um, the people in, I mean, Justin Hume's terrific. I mean, I know he doesn't work in the industry, but he um, really does have the connections. And, and yeah. I've, I've seen, I, I was impressed with him and his uh, ability to communicate and, and uh, be diligent about what he brought to the table starting in, in 21, but he's so much more plugged in now and so much more on top of uh, the physical market that that's, I don't know how people who are um, deeply invested in the space uh, wouldn't have a subscription to um, Uranium Insider and, and uh, get his, um, uh, you know, daily membership videos, which are, I mean, they're not every day, but you get the, you get the data sheet every day and so forth. So, um, people like that uh and then among the among retail uh people um i would like to uh, mention uh borgia um who yeah. always uh is a great contributor especially for anything related to um because uh, adam prom and, and kazakhstan in general the whole you know eastern uh central asia type uh space he's really on top of that um uh Harry Chris is one I like a lot. Now I haven't seen this seen much too much from him lately. People are probably saying that about me too with the, with uh, this move. I've been kind of quiet, but um, but he always, you know, I like when people uh, aren't doing a lot of hype when they are contributing uh, good information. And there's a lot of people who um, you know are are, are wonderful about uh, grabbing the latest videos and making sure everybody knows they're out there like an arf and and then certainly yeah. from. Um, helping keep everyone's attitude up, uh, you know, Tom, um, uh, Nostra Thomas is, I consider a friend and, um, he's a, a big, he's a great guy. Community. Yeah. Definitely. Um, all, all those you have numbers here are great guys and uh, everybody brings something to our Iranian community. That, that, that is really a fact. Uh, that's about yeah, it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. Let me interrupt you for a second. So I don't want to say, and 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 you uh, in particular, so you, congratulations to you on mm -hmm. hitting 100 interviews. Thank 100 you, interviews in nine months. Yeah. And uh, I remember when you first uh, reached out to the community to say, I'm thinking about doing these interviews. I'm thinking about having a website where I do some deeper analysis. Would anybody be interested? I remember that. And you've you've done an incredible uh, service for for the the sector, and I, I just wanted to ask you: Is it what you envisioned, and is it or has it become a, kind of a full time job? I don't know how it can't be at this point. So, well, I I will tell you the story. Uh, this achievement is beyond my any dream I had. I will achieve in such a short period. Like you said, in nine or ten months, I achieved. Uh, I have more than 7,000 followers. That is a big, enormous number for me. I would uh, I would think when I started, I would probably have that number in maybe five years or something like that. But really, I have an enormous support of people like you, people that are on Twitter, people that are interested in uranium. And really, they gave, they give me a tremendous support that keeps me going on. So I have my regular business. I'm in the real estate business here in Croatia. I'm doing that also parallel with this. But uh, frankly, I will try to keep more focus on this part of my new, new venture and uh, try to bring this, uh, my interviews to the next level, try to improve them, try to bring even more more and better guests. But I believe that I really brought creme de la creme when it comes to uranium uh, company CEOs. Uh, there are some few that, that, that were not in my show. And my plan, when I started, I, I said publicly that my goal is to bring all 100 and we, at the moment, like we have 140 uranium companies or something like that. And my goal is to bring 100 CEOs to my show. So my first milestone was 100 interviews recorded. 
But my next goal is to bring 100 Uranium CEOs to my show. And definitely yeah. I will try that. And that is all that is all because of people, like I said, people like you that give me give me a, a big push because they are supporting me. They send me messages, they text me. And I always try to uh, ask their questions, your question to my to my show for my guests because it's not it's not just me. I want I want this format to be that kind of format that people can all their questions can be asked to my guests. I really I'm I'm trying not to filter any questions. I I ask the questions in 90%, uh, not always, I have to say that. There are sometimes you have a CEO that is not comfort, comfortable with all questions. I, I I have to have that disclaimer, but all my interviews are not edited. They are all mine and your and uh, questions from my followers. I would never accept an interview that some company would say, okay, you have to ask the questions we send you. I would decline that interview. Frankly, if if they offer me to pay me a nice amount of money, in uh, but the, if they will, uh, they have, they they want their questions to be asked, I would decline definitely. And uh, just to return on your first question, uh, you asked me uh, if this will be or it is my full time business. It's not, but I believe we I am going there. And I'm near. Uh, I'm, I'm more near to this goal of this becoming my full-time job. Nice. Yeah. What's <clears throat> speaking of uh, Stephen having a lot of energy? He's certainly your. Uh, I don't know how you can do it without a you know a, a booking agent or something setting these interviews <laughs> up because it's it's pretty. That's a yeah. Uh, be, uh, uh, well, a lot of people uh, ask me the same question and I say always the same answer. 24 hour day is too short for me. <laughs> I really, I really, uh, I'm putting all my energy into this. I have a family, of course, I have a business. I have private, some other private obligations, but I really try to, uh, all my free time is going into this, all my free time. So when I'm not traveling, when I'm not uh, doing my first job, when I'm not with my family, and I always give 100% into this content and to bring some value to our community. That is my goal, and I will continue to do it. That answers another question that I had is, are you are you getting out on the Adriatic and having fun like you used to? Um, doesn't sound like it right now. No, definitely no, because uh, I have much less time before, like before. But uh, usually, I go more often in the summer, in the spring, and the spring is coming here in Croatia right now as we speak. So I will go more often there. So my interviews will probably be recorded from uh, from a boat deck. Not, <laughs> not 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 from the boat deck. But I would like that. Maybe this format in this show, X Investors, I don't have any problems. It's it's this format is more of like this leisure format, and I can film it basically from from the boat. And maybe I will do it. But uh, the other uh, CEO and market expert interviews, I have to have some some degree of professionalism, so to say. So sure. it's it's a recorded from my office uh, usually. But definitely, I will go more on the Adriatic because my origins are from the Adriatic. I live in Zagreb, that is the capital of Croatia. But my origins are from one beautiful island. It's called Island of Kirk in the Adriatic, in northern Adriatic. And I often go there. Uh, usually, before, I went like two times, two or three times per month. Now, not so much anymore. But definitely, I will try to go much more than I like like in when I started doing interviews my my uh, my vacation really was vacation days were declining big time yeah but I'm not complaining I'm not complaining at all I love this I don't have any problems with that but I'll also I like to go on the Adriatic coast so I will try to mix the both 
Good, good. It'd be good to see you have some fun along the way, but you're certainly yeah. effective in the meantime. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I will not. <laughs>